Okay, welcome back to Nickelodeon's Comic Corner. Classic, less non classics. <clears throat> this is episode number 1601 and double shot number 1495. <clears throat> yes. This one is going to be a combination of digital and physical stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're, we're basically going to do Runaways. Yes. We're starting the second volume for this series. Now, we're pretty much covering this one, the first half of the, not the second volume per se, just the first half of the Brian K. Vaughn issues. Now, we're first starting with the very first story arc of this run, starting with issue number one. Yes. Now, in these issues, we're introduced to a few new things. For example... In the very first issue, we reveal a new character, Victor Machina, which they slowly developed this character, and the big plot thread is basically with him is that, oh yeah, he's going to become this this, this this particular champion, this so-called champ called Victorious, who becomes a massive dictator, which you probably think, wait, did Brian K. Vaughn rip off Armageddon 2001 in the year 2004? You could say yes, but here's the thing. He was some guy in some suit of armor who was revealed to be like a superhero they were teasing the whole time and then like a leak and they had to make his life in a change. <clears throat> they kind of tweaked it a bit where he was going to be the leader, was going to be this particular like vicious person and then they kind of changed him. We also had a debut of Excelsior, otherwise known as The Loners, who actually got their own spin-off book after this. Yes, seriously. A group made their debut in this book and got a spin-off miniseries. Who are these characters? Darkhawk, Kate Power of Power Pack, aka Lightspeed. Yes, yeah, seriously, that's her name. Lightspeed. Not like Lightspeed Rescue, she made a debut back in the 80s, so Power Rangers cannot claim that, that the name Lightspeed is trademarked by them. There's also Ricochet. There is also, I think her name is Turbo from Yes, there's a character named Turbo. From New Warriors, I believe she was from the later issues of the book, is from the original volume. And this group was financed by, get this, Rick Jones. Yes, he basically financed this group off of his book that he is his autobiography he published, called Sidekick. Oh okay, yeah, here's the thing about Rick Jones. They revealed this also in Brian McAbendis's book. He's the cousin of Jessica Jones. Yeah, they can listen in in this particular era. He just cuts Jessica Jones, and not only is he a writer, he's also a musician. Yes, musician. Yes, the thing with Rick Jones is is that Marvel in the last twenty years have been trying to do something with this character. It's like they pretty much revived him after like nothing was done for him for about 20, 20 30 years. Yeah, it seems as though by the time the seventies roll around, there was like nothing for him to do. It's like he just dropped off face of the earth. He didn't do very much afterwards, and, and if you're curious, though, what the heck happened to Rick Jones currently? He's dead. Yep. Nick Spencer got him killed off in the pages of Secret Empire by being executed. Yes, he, he was real prior to this to be a hacker known as Whisper, who was a supporting character in the Sam Wilson book. And then, of course, because of the fact he leaked something to the Resistance, he got executed by Hydra Cap. And currently he's, well, he was dead, and then they kind of revived him in Mortal Hulk, where he became a new abomination, even though he was previously abomination. Yeah, basically after this, he actually, sort of a brief revival. Uh, Jeff Lowe made him A-bomb, basically new abomination for several years, until he got cured of that ability, thanks to, of course, to, oh, thanks to, of course, to Doc Green. And then he develops a new build to main Whisper, and then he later died and came back as another abomination. He's kind of like a zombie now. It's kind of weird. <clears throat> now, who was the father of Victor Machina? Ultron. Yep, Ultron. Which, I'm like, that's interesting. Ultron. I also love the fact they explore his backstory, basically, of how he first became, which was explored back in the... Back in the, I believe it was like early 70s, I think it was. Now, in case you don't know who created Ultron, but yeah, people do know about Ultron thanks, of course, to Age of Ultron. And the fact he's a long-running Marvel villain in the universe. And also he popped up in Marvel Ultimate Alliance. Now, who created Ultron? Roy Thomas. 
Yes, Roy Thomas created Ultron, the human killing robot. Now you might be also asking, is there a character at DC that is similar to Ultron? None I can think of. You could think maybe Red Tornado, but no, Red Tornado is, for him, he is uh, similar to the Vision from Marvel Comics. I would say the only character I would say is similar to that. I mean, I could, you could say maybe Amazo, but he's more rip. He's more of a take on a super adaptoid. Yep. And before they reveal Ultron was was Victor Machina's father, there were suggestions that various other villains like Electro, Galactus, Doctor Doom, and of course they had Doctor Doom show up in here, but this actually was a robot. And they did fight. They did fight Ultron. Heck, they had Ultron fight a character he never fought before ever before prior to this. Who did he fight? He got into a fight with freaking Darkhawk. Yes, which is so awesome. Plus, I love the fact that Brian K. Vaughn brought back his artist who did that previous volume. Uh, what is the name of this artist? This artist. Oh, yeah, by the way, part of this, we also appearance by The Wrecking Crew. Yes, The Wrecking Crew. Which, of course, the, the Runaways beat the crap out of these people. Mm hmm. Oh, I almost forgot. Chamber from Generation X. He's part of the group, too. And it's a good thing these characters are, in fact, longtime fans. So when they see people, they meet for the first time. Oh, yeah, their, their, their artist's name is Adrian Afia. Yes, it's a good thing that the Runaways are basically people who actually do actual research. So they know who all, who when, when they first meet all of the, when, when they meet the loners, they pretty much know who exactly who all they are, with the exception of Ricochet. Ricochet, if you don't know who the heck this guy is, no, it is not the same name. It's not the the guy who's also the wrestler who works for WWE, who WWE doesn't give a crap about half the time. This is actually an identity that Spider-Man once assumed. Yes, Spider-Man. I saw should point out that at the time we show up in this comic book, he lived in the comics for about five years at this point, so it's not surprising he always had no idea who the heck he is. Well, Spider-Man did briefly assume it was during this storyline known as Identity Crisis, where he was Ricochet, he was Dust, yes, a character named Dust, not related to the X-Men character. There was also the Hornet, which the guy who was the Hornet that got killed off, and there was like um, one other character that basically he was, and then like after the storyline, the costumes are basically laying stores in place. Until Black Marvel, yes, a go to the superhero basically dug up these costumes and gave it to four random people. Dust became a woman. And this Ricochet is the current one. And he's, you could say he's a minor ripoff of Robin from DC. Kind of in a way because of the R's. But aside from that, they have nothing really much else in common. Who the guy is under his mask, let's see. Uh, they were... I should now. What was the group he was part of? Well, they had a brief solo book. You might think Identity Crisis. Oh crap! Is that the DC book? No. This is completely something else altogether. Yes, Identity Crisis would later lay groundwork for another. Um, group of characters who are loosely associated with 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 um, Spider-Man. Now, Spider-Man himself would, in fact, know about these characters. Yes, he does know about the lo the um, the group. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ah, uh, here it is. Oh yeah, also, they also had, um, the, the third Spider-Woman was briefly part of the group. Let's see, here's Ricochet right here. Ricochet, okay, he was part of the group known as the Stingers. Yes. Uh, oddly enough, when it comes to Stingers, he, this group only lasted, the series only lasted about 12 issues. Sorry, issue zero, wrapped up issues, uh, number 12. 
it wasn't particularly like a long lasting series per se. I thought it was 2000. No, this group first showed back in 1998, roughly about a couple years after the events of Identity Crisis. Yeah. So it was Dust, Hornet, Prodigy, and Ricochet. Uh, Prodigy's most racist thing he was involved with was basically trying to ride the initiative. And now we're talking some Dust. I don't think she's much active anymore. No. Ricochet has done some stuff since then. You might think, okay, what's his most recent thing he did? Well, he briefly did appear in the pages of Ben Roy Scarlet Spider, but that was it. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, would they loan it? Now, I love the fact that Dark Hawk got a chance to fight Ultron because he never fought him with the original title. He fought other villains, like, like for example, he fought freaking Hobgoblin in his own solo book, including the guy who became Portal who popped out the pages of the Wolverines. And I thought this was really good, the fact that he fought him because, like I said, never fought him before. So, he fights him, defeats him, and Victor Machina stays on with the Runaways. And he was pretty much an integral part of the group for the rest of this flying, even the next flying for the series, until we'll have pages of vision. But these issues are really good. Uh, the story is called True Believers. Yep. True Believers. I give this opening story arc a... I give it roughly a 9 out of 10. It's a great story arc. And great way to start off the very second volume for the series. Next up, it is... Runaways, Volume 5, Escape to New York. Yeah, back to these Digest books. Now, this book is going to you 7 to 12 of Runaways, Volume 2. And this right here is halfway through Brian K. Vaughn's run for the book. Now, with this particular storyline, this, of course, is... Now, they do tease a couple things. I forgot to mention this. Uh, they do tease one thing that does play a role later. That does get... Uh, they do lose something here, but does get paid off to years later. This one kind of does the same thing, too. And what was this? Basically, Corolla uh, calling Julie Power pretty. Yes, she says she's very pretty. And what is that tease? The fact that Corolla was was basically, there was they were, they were implying that she is, in fact, a les she likes girls, a.k.a. a lesbian. Here, they confirm in the very first issue of this book, where... Like, after doing what, whatever, and of course, they just have a day in town. Of course, she hangs out with Nico, where she actually tries to kiss her in the park. And this also has another thing going on with this. Of course, this would actually be uh, something that the, that the current writer, the most recent writer for Runaways, actually followed up with years later, where Nico wanted to start a relationship with Corolla. But at the time, she was dating somebody else at that point. And then she broke up with that person. And then she hooked up with Nico until the end of the volume. Where the relationship abruptly ended because of bullcrap related to her powers. So, they also show off one new character in this particular story arc. And that is Exfin. Uh, uh, Zavin. Who is this character? Corolla's fiance. Yes. Because Corolla is an alien... They have it where apparently her parents, who are somehow still alive, they very somehow they're still alive despite the fact they got killed by freaking giant golems in the previous volume. They apparently took the time prior to their apparent deaths to set up an arranged marriage between her and this scroll, who has the powers of a super scroll. I'm not kidding about that. He seriously does, and because he's a scroll, he's a shapeshifter, which means he can change his gender to be a woman. And then they go off to space for a brief period of time. Don't, don't worry, she does come back later on. Mm -hmm. But that's only the first few issues. Next few issues has a, uh, basically a follow-up, basically has the return of Cloak and Dagger to the series. I'm like, this is cool, I like this. Where Cloak is framed for apparently for beating up Dagger, and he's on the run because of it. And who actually is responsible for this, and why did Teddy get beat up? Uh, not exactly really clear. It's a guy who apparently copied Cloak's power for some reason. And 
it was implied this guy who was stalking Teddy might have been actually in love with her. Yes, so we also have return of the we also have return of Captain America and Iron Man to the series. Yeah, this is the period of time when Bamako Bendis was writing New Avengers titles, so of course they had these characters make guest appearance. But it's just these two, Spider Man and Wolverine. And you're thinking, that's it? Where's Jessica Drew, the original Spider Woman? Uh yeah, she's in the book, but she doesn't do much of anything. And Spider Man does have his first ever meeting with the Runaways, which I thought was just really cool on the part of Brian K. Von Du. Now you might be asking, Nick, did in fact has Brian K. Von ever wrote any Spider Man books? <laughs> you might ask. And the answer is yes. Yes, he has. It was actually, I think it was between the volumes that he did. It was actually the same time he worked on this book. He worked on a Dr. Octopus miniseries. Yes, seriously. The guy didn't really do a lot in Marvel. I get the reason why he threw in Chamber in here. Because he wrote the Chamber miniseries. And you're thinking, Chamber had a miniseries? Yes, he did. Yeah, he also wrote Mystique. He's also an issue of Cable, Wolverine. So he's an experienced writer, Wolverine. Issue of X Unlimited. There's also a thing of Cyclops. There's also this funny thing of Molly Hayes. Really want to touch Wolverine's head because he thought he joked it, which I thought was so funny. And these kids are clearly fans of the superheroes. So they they find out that it, that the person responsible is, is a male nurse. Like, why the heck this male nurse is responsible for this? Like I said, stalker. And eventually Cloak does confront and take back his powers from this guy. And Supplied he went to jail. Teddy, of course, basically gets reunited with the runaways, which I thought this was actually pretty cool. Yeah, how they got away from the from the pride. Pride sort of in the way sealed them in the way. It was kind of weirdly uh, weird. They went off someplace, but here they return again. My guess is Brian K. Vaughn must have really liked writing the runaways. So why not have make appearance again? A might be asking, did he ever write a Cloak and Dagger book after this? Nope. He never did. And you're thinking, why didn't he? I have no idea. I don't know. I have reviewed his his actual, like, last special book he worked on Marvel, which is Doctor Strange the Oath. Yeah, that's the weird thing about Brian King Vaughn. It seems as though he wrote independent stuff to do a lot of stuff for, like, one company. So I've also reviewed for him his old X-Men run. And that's it. I haven't that much for him for, for Marvel. I've reviewed like pretty much almost the entirety of his run for... Like I viewed his, his Batman stuff he worked on. Which is all in trade by the way. Mm -hmm. Yep. So... And surprisingly the, the, the Runaways are not put back in foster care by the, the Avengers. Why not? Don't know. Brian came up probably didn't like doing that so... They did about to do that. They also imply in the book that the pride was still back. The the pride basically picked her death, even though it's not true. But I like the fact they kind of set that up there. Mm -hmm. Yep. And okay. So, is there anything else like with that with dagger basically taken care of? This is pretty much like fifty percent done with Brian K. Vaughn's run for the second volume for the series. And by the way, I get this book roughly a. I'll give it a 9.5 out of 10. It's a damn good book. And still clearly establishes the fact that Brian K. Vaughn is one damn good writer. And you might be thinking, is there any books the guy currently is working on now? And is there, you might ask? Yes. He is going to be resuming his run for Saga. Yes, Saga is going to be resuming soon. Mm hmm. Yes, yeah, Saga is resuming first time in about three years. Yeah, after issue 52, 50, 54, which we came out three years ago, uh, apparently was announced that next year we're actually going to see the return of this title, which I'm so happy with that. Mm hmm. Now you might be thinking, okay, like, how much. Okay. Like, how much of Brian K. Vaughn's work have I officially reviewed? 
Well, the answer is pretty simple, really. I have read his Why Last Man series, and you've all felt my, my thoughts on that particular one. I have also viewed his Batman False Faces trade, which pretty much collected his work for Batman, including a couple issues of Wonder Woman, an issue of Super, Superman Batman, Why the Last Man. Let's see, I also review pretty much all those that came out for Saga so far. Mm -hmm. I review this entire series for Paper Girls. And I believe I did review Tales of Major Apocalypse, I think, but that's pretty much it. So a good good small chunk of stuff. And ha and yes, I have reviewed Doctor Strange Yelp, which is by far one of the best Doctor Strange books ever written. Yep. But yeah, that's gonna be pretty much it for this particular review. Um I don't have any more videos planned for today, so stay tuned for tomorrow for my my reviews I normally do tomorrow. And if I somehow get a chance to get Comic Con done, you all know, first know when I attend to a video, okay? Next video. Bye.